No one knows where and when the first Sunday school was held, but by the second half of the 1700s, various people were teaching children either in their homes or in churches. But it wasn't until this man, Robert Rakes, began his Sunday school in 1780 that a national movement started. Robert Rakes was a Gloucester publisher, newspaper owner. The story goes, according to Rakes, that he was working in his study on a Sunday afternoon and he was disturbed by the noise of boys outside uh, playing in the street. And he wondered why they were doing that and realized it was a Sunday. At the time, very few children received an education. Most of them had to work. Children would very often start work, maybe as young as five, and children in the mines and the potteries, you know, they're 18-hour days. So, and that was six days a week. So Sundays were the only day that they had off. So Rakes had the idea to set up a school for them. During the course of the day, they would have done some reading practice, possibly a little writing. They would have then have gone to church for the afternoon and then come to do the catechism class after church. So in that way, Rakes had kept them off the street for most of the day. <laughs> the women who taught in the schools also benefited. This was enormously empowering because women at that time had no access to any sort of higher education, career prospects, and uh, women really were able to use their skills in leadership in a way that there was no other area of life that they could do that. Rakes published an article in his journal that spread the idea to other towns and cities, but studying on a Sunday caused some controversy. There were Christians who thought that on the Sabbath you shouldn't work, and learning writing and certainly learning arithmetic smacked too much of work on the Sabbath. So this was a controversy amongst the early founders of Sunday schools. And there weren't just worries about breaking the Sabbath. The propertied classes were some of them worried that if people learnt to read, the poor learnt to read, they might read radical pamphlets and they weren't happy at all about the poor having uncensored access to the Bible and discovering that God was on the side of the poor. And so reading the Bible themselves was about discovering good news for the poor. By the mid-19th century, 1.4 million children went to Sunday school. They were the centre of community life and each one would have its own impressive banner. What's fascinating is the images on them. Um, you'll notice that one there has got a lighthouse. So that's a very common image because it's about saving children. That fellow looks a bit angry, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. Yeah, that train a child up in the way it should go is, mm. is from the writings of St Paul, I think. I think, actually, it's probably modelled on the actual Sunday school superintendent. He looks like a Victorian gentleman. You just imagine the children, if that's looking from the wall down at you, and you think, you'd be very good. Uh, how did the banners come about? The banners are very much like the logos of their day. They were setting what the Sunday school stands for. And then, of course, the real purpose was for taking outside the Sunday school to march. And you'd all march behind your banner. When? When would the marches happen? It could be Sunday school anniversary, but the big ones were the wit walks. These events were the highlight of the year and brought the streets to a standstill. And it wasn't just young children who would attend Sunday school. This is uh, extracts from soldiers' letters. This, you notice the date is 1917. This is the First World War. That's right. And wow. it's at a time when this church is having the Sunday school anniversary mm -hmm. and all these young men who are actually part of the Sunday school have written letters because they can't be there. It's really quite moving. And like this chap here, yeah. Jay Partington, and he says, I'm proud to say that it is the good teachings I've received there that have been my greatest help in times of danger and temptation. Yeah, Sunday school was all about praising children as well and dignifying them, wasn't it? And very much in encouraging them, so you got medals for regular attendance. It was yeah. about belonging, it was where you met your friends, it was where the, you had social activities. 
annual sports, a public tea. This is children's treat. Exactly. So this is the outing. You can see here they're going in wagons. Wagons will leave the hillside chapel. And the children's treat would perhaps be the only chance they ever got to go outside their community. And of course, music was so important. The songs were such a part of Sunday school. Here's a hymn and tune book. And it's tonic sulfur. It's like, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Yes. You see, they wouldn't have had an instrument necessarily, so they had to use their voices. So, so, mi, mi, re, mi, so, so. Haha, <laughs> we know that one. <laughs> For many, the mention of Sunday school brings memories flooding back. The anniversary days, I suppose, really became part of the highlight, highlight of the year. Because obviously, apart from anything else, one, one had a new dress, you know, for the Sunday school anniversary. I used to think how good it would be to carry one of the banners in the great Sunday school parades which took place. And I had my eye on those poles First of all, you might be allowed to hold one of the strings that steadied it, but when you reach adolescence, you might just be big enough, and I think I just about made it, <laughs> to carry the actual banner. All the other Sunday schools in the area would come to us, and when they had their anniversary, we would go to them, all trooped out through the streets together. Over a hundred of us, it was a wonderful time. In the afternoon and the evening, uh, the, 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 a large choir made up of the Sunday school children would, in inverted commas, entertain the congregation. There were probably about 50, 60 children, all in their best frocks and so on, were all arranged on the stage, going up in, in tears. I can never remember my words. I've more or less got written, written on my sleeve, you know, which is quite against the rule. Rules to, to sing some solo, and it was always some daft business about you know birds and bees and trees and flowers and what, what have you. There's no amplification or anything. If you couldn't be heard, that was you off, and they got somebody else in. You know. I can remember we had this uh, afternoon when we we were pretending to bake. I don't think we had any ingredients whatsoever, um, and then the teachers took away our cake tins. Then they came back with all these cakes that we'd made, <laughs> which uh, I think what they were trying to teach us is that miracles do happen. <laughs> Since the 1950s, fewer and fewer children have attended Sunday school. These days, there are so many other options. Shops and restaurants are open. There are countless leisure activities. Sunday schools face a lot of competition. And here in this cinema in Manchester, loads of children come every Sunday, but it's not to see the latest blockbuster. They're here as part of Ivy Church, and whilst their parents are worshipping in screen one, they're next door. Dave, why do you meet in a cinema? Well, uh, the church is um, over 100 years old. We've got our own building, but we outgrew it several years ago. And um, trying to find somewhere where there's a big meeting place for everyone to meet together, but also lots of separate rooms. It's blooming cold out here. I wish the weather would dry up, because I don't want to be as cold as last night. I know what you're doing here, you do in a really contemporary way. But do you feel like what you do owes anything to the original Sunday school movement? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we're still telling the same stories. Um, if you go to some of the younger groups, you'll, you'll hear that we're singing some of the same songs as well. And, um, you know, it's, it, children have uh, always wanted community, friendship, and those are the, the key things here. Sometimes it seems like there isn't a link to Jesus, but there actually is quite a big link to Jesus. I've learned that it doesn't matter how you look like, God still loves you. And what you see here today are the youth, the, the secondary school children, leading uh, the, the primary school children, the younger children. I enjoy coming because I can teach the younger ones and then have more of like an empowering role. And like, obviously for me, it's more the confidence. It's definitely given me, you know, a real sense of right and wrong. And I take everything I've learned in church out into the real world and um, I can sort of pass that on to my friends. The best thing about Sunday school is very fun. Red roll. It's great my line. <laughs> One of the things that has changed is that children are, are fantastic critics and they know when they're bored. So I think kind of doing the sim similar stuff has, has always been done, but just more and more through the language of fun. Anyway, Jesus, 
he was, he was Children today to have big questions. They perhaps always have done. Um, you know, why am I here? Who am I? Does my life have meaning, purpose? Mm -hmm. Is there a God? And um, I, I love the idea that this can be a place where, um, for some children, it might be the only place where they can begin to unpack some of those questions. Jesus wrote a different rule. He wrote the rule which was, love your neighbour. Love everyone the same. I don't think Jesus is just for those that have been brought up in a Christian family. I think um, Jesus came for everyone. Jesus loves everyone, and his message has always been for everyone.